Well, good morning. We are ready to start this live feed through Facebook and start our service this morning here at First Church. Uh, we welcome to this um, worship time and prayer time. So if you are listening or watching us right now, we ask you to uh, maybe text or call your friends, let them know that we are streaming live through Facebook if they wanted to be part of the service. So we like to start with a worship time and our first song this morning is uh, Mighty to Save. You walk with 
Good morning. My name is Bob Carlson. I'm the assistant pastor here at First United Methodist Church in Punta Gorda, Florida, and we are so glad to have you with us. Now, we realize you're not here physically because of the coronavirus. We have closed down the services, but we know that you're out there uh, on Facebook. And I might add that uh, our senior pastor, uh, Mike Loomis, is not here today. His wife, Debbie, uh, had a medical emergency on Thursday. She has been in the hospital. She expects to be getting out soon. And we want to assure you that was not coronavirus. So we're okay there. It seems like the strangest kind of service we have ever had to stand here and play the instruments and sing. And we're going to preach before uh, a bunch of empty seats, hundreds of them. Reminds me of a story that a friend of mine has told. Uh, his name is Nicky. He is a, a ventriloquial figure. That's the politically correct term for ventriloquist dummy, okay? Well, Nicky's told the story about the pastor that got up and he was preaching so long, he went on and on and on and on, and one of the parishioners died right there in the service. So the usher called uh, 911, EMTs came, they carried out eight parishioners before they figured out which one of them was dead. Well, I hope you'll stay with us. We're not going to preach that long today. Uh, we'll just make this a day that, that we will rejoice in the Lord. We'll worship him. We'll look at his word. And we hope that if, you, um, if you've enjoyed the service, that you'll send us a note there on Facebook and let us know that you were with us for this service. Would you pray with me, please? Our Heavenly Father... How we thank you that you're the God who 
knows the beginning from the end. This coronavirus and all of the difficulties that come into our lives never catches you by surprise, God. We're so glad that just as we sang, I need you every hour, you're there to respond to our need. You are the God who is the ever-present help in the time of trouble. And so we thank you, God, that you're here for us today. And Lord, we're thankful too that um, during this crisis, our president, President Donald Trump, has declared today a national day of prayer, calling on all Americans to pray just as they have many times during difficult times in our, our history. We thank you, Lord, that you are the God who is there for not only us, but for people around the world who are suffering today. You've told us that we're to come boldly to the throne of grace. And there we will obtain mercy and find grace to help in this time of trouble. And Lord, in the times of uncertainty, misinformation, all the fears, the suffering, the financial burdens, Lord, God, give us the peace that we need, the wisdom, protection, the healing. Even as we're instructed in 1 Peter chapter 5, we cast all of our cares upon you, our God, because you do care for us. We pray that our faith will be increased. We pray that during even this time that we're together this morning, that we will sense your presence in a new way and know that in the midst of trouble, you're the God who is there, who has no trouble, but cares about ours. And Lord, we pray today for every church in our community and really around the world, because we are your people. You have redeemed us. You've brought us out of spiritual darkness into your marvelous light. And so we pray, Lord, that we would be the light of the world wherever we are and that people would see Christ living in us in the midst of this difficulty. Help us, Lord, to be there in practical ways for people who need us as well. And God, we pray that during this service that we will hear your voice, that we will respond appropriately. And now we pray the prayer that Jesus has taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not <clears throat> into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning, First Church. My name is Katie. And I'm Maddie. And we are so happy you have joined us for worship today. We have a lot going on around here, so we wanted to let you know about a few important things coming up for you and your family. So check these out. So, I'm here to dispel a nasty rumor that's been going around that I'm leaving. Well, let me take care of that for you right now. It's true. Um, this is me listening for at least a few cries of anguish and despair from some of you. Anyway, this little girl here is only one of the reasons why I'm leaving. Doesn't she just look like she's up to no good? So, I understand there will be not one, but three receptions, one after each service, celebrating my leaving on March 29th, so that all y'all can come by and wish me good luck or good riddance. I'll see you then. Bye-bye. Even if people are unable to be in worship, the ministries of the church go on. The missions that we try to make a difference in the world with continue, and our financial obligations continue as well. And so we invite you, if you can, to give online through our website, you can sign up for automatic draft giving. Just contact the office and they'll walk you through that. 
and then auto pay um, through your or bill pay through your own bank website, of course, is something that you can use. And so let's together be a people of hope. So we'll pray together and we'll trust God in the midst of all of this. Check on your friends and neighbors, especially some of those who are elderly or who may be compromised. And in the midst of all this, with some of the concerns out there, people may get isolated and lonely. So check on them, love on them as best you can. We want to thank you for joining us for worship today. For more information about everything going on here at First Church, please see the bulletin or visit whatisfirst.com slash events. And remember, you heard it here first. Have a great week. Well, this is the time in the service that we typically take the offering, but of course we're not going to do that. There are only a few people sitting out there, so we won't put you on the spot. But as Pastor Mike said, uh, if you would like, you may either send in a check to the church or drop it off, or of course you can go online and there are various ways that you can um, give your offering, and it's a wonderful idea. It was on Thursday night that I was asked if I would preach today, and then it was on Friday night, I was told that the way it would be is like this, with empty seats, and I would be speaking to, uh, well, all these empty seats, and you who are watching on Facebook. And it's a little bit strange, a little bit difficult, but um, this morning, what we're going to do is take a close look at what the Bible has to say about repentance. Probably we don't hear a lot about that, and it's not a, a warm and fuzzy, a feel-good message, but on the other hand, I don't intend it to be a hellfire and brimstone sermon either. When it comes to the scripture though, we need to have the attitude that if the shoe fits, wear it. So we need to ask the Holy Spirit that he will, that he will speak to us at this time. Would you pray with me please? God, our Heavenly Father, we go about our, our way, sometimes ignoring you. We know you, we love you, but we get busy, we're distracted. Today, Lord, help us to just be calm and listen to you. Listen through your word. We pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would come and speak to each of our hearts. Point out to us anything that is causing us to displease you. Anything that stunts our growth as believers. Anything that would hide the light of the Lord Jesus Christ in us. God, we pray that you would help us to genuinely repent. And Lord, we pray that you would really bring a revival in our hearts. A revival in our church and around the world. May your people be revived and become all that you want us to be. For we pray this in the name of Jesus, our Savior and our Lord. Amen. The passage of scripture we'll look at is found in Luke chapter 13, uh, verses 1 through 9. You may follow along in the Bible that you might have there, where you ever you are, or we're going to have it on the screen and you'll be able to see that and follow along. Luke chapter 13, verses 1 through 9, and I'm reading from the New International Version. Now there were some, some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Jesus answered, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Or those 18 who died when the Tower of Siloam fell on them. Do you think they were more guilty than all the other live, others living in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Then he told us this parable. A man had a fig tree growing in his vineyard, and he went to look for fruit on it, but did not find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, for three years now, 
I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should I use up the soil? Sir, the man replied, leave it alone for one more year and I'll dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. As I said, the message is about repentance. Let me talk to you before I kind of define and describe what repentance is. Let's talk about what it is not, because I believe there's a lot of misunderstanding about repentance. It's not mere regret. A lot of people regret things, don't they? Uh, I saw a cartoon uh, the other day where a man was wash doing the laundry and his wife is standing at the door and saying, you've been doing laundry, you've been doing dishes, you've been doing all these chores that I have been after you to do for so long and suddenly you're doing them without my pestering you. What size boat did you buy? <laughs> you know, we, we may not necessarily regret that we did something, but we, we regret that we've been found out, don't we? Well, that's the case. It's not merely regret. We don't, we don't like the consequences sometimes that we're going to suffer because of our words or actions. That's not necessarily repentance, though, is it? We don't like how our words and actions are going to cause harm to others. Many times we really regret because we've said something or done something that we know is going to hurt somebody, but that in itself is not repentance. And of course, we're sorry that we got caught. That's so often the case. In fact, many times when we're confronted with our wrongdoing, our sin, uh, we deny it, don't we? We've seen politician after politician get up and deny before the nation that they committed this sin that they were accused of, and eventually it's proven that they indeed committed that sin, and they have to confess to it. Well, here's what the dictionary says repentance is. It's to feel or express sincere regret or remorse about one's wrongdoing or sin. Not just words of sorrow, I'm sorry. It's saying that there's more to it than that. But let, let's talk about what the Bible says that repentance is. The word in the Greek New Testament here in this passage in Luke chapter 13, the word there means to think differently, to reconsider. It's a, it's a turnaround in the way that you believe about something. It's not just words, is it? It's something from our heart we finally agree with God and we confess to him that we have sinned. Well, we need to be people who will truly agree with God. God knows best. God knows our hearts. Have you ever woken during the night and suddenly something came to your mind that you said or you did and you wish that you hadn't and you lie there just feeling so badly about it, that's the time for us to repent, isn't it? The first time for us to repent, though, is when we come to the realization that we have in our heart rejected God's offer of salvation through Jesus Christ. When we have said no to God, perhaps it wasn't outright that we said it, but God's been tugging at our heart and we felt like we were pretty self-sufficient. We were doing okay on our own. We didn't need any kind of help. So we were saying no and pushing God aside. And if today you are in that position, if you've never put your faith in Jesus Christ as Savior and know what it means for God to cleanse you of your sins, for you to know that experience of realizing that all of your sins are gone and God doesn't hold them against you anymore and you have no reason to bring them up because God has set them aside. He's washed them away in the blood of Jesus Christ. I urge you today in the privacy of your own home or wherever you might be that you will pray, God, forgive me for my sins. Cleanse me. 
May the spirit of Jesus come and live in my heart. Maybe you'll have a great feeling about that. Maybe you won't. But pray that prayer. You know, maybe it's uh, providential, fortunate, that we are not filled in this building with people. And perhaps if I asked you to raise your hand or come forward to put your faith in Christ, it could be very difficult. But right now, wherever you are, you can quietly, privately put your faith in him and be cleansed if you will truly repent. But I would hope that you won't keep it a secret. Once you have really known that Christ is your Savior and your Lord, then I hope that you will tell others. And I hope, too, that others will see that in you. God is always asking us to repent. There are many instances in the Bible where we're called upon to repent. What are we supposed to repent of? There are sins that we have committed against others, certainly against God. We have ignored him. We have neglected our relationship with him. Those who have trusted him, perhaps long ago, still need to repent. We have said things and done things that have hurt others. We have neglected to do things that God has told us to do. In fact, James tells us that to know to do something that is good and not do it, it is sin. And so while somebody else may look on and not consider it to be sin, if God says it's sin, we need to repent of that sin. I can't tell you what that is in your life. God tells me what is in my life. And I, I try to make sure that I repent and do it often so that it doesn't build up and I become callous because that's what happens. When we fail to respond to the Holy Spirit and his nudging us, we become hardened. We don't hear his voice anymore. And that is a very sad place for us to be, a condition we better not be in. Let us all repent of our sins. I like the way John puts it in 1 John 1, 9, that if we confess our sins, and that is, that is really repenting, that is, it's agreeing with God, changing our mind about it and saying, God, you're right on this. If we confess our sins, he is faithful, he is righteous to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's something we can hang on to. There are some people that feel so secure in their salvation that they don't even think about it. They feel that because I put my faith in Jesus, I don't need to worry about any of that. But what a way to live. Can you imagine somebody you love and you refuse to ask their forgiveness? Can you imagine how it would hurt them? It certainly hurts God. God is calling on us to repent and we need to call upon others to repent as well. Now you may say, repent or perish, that's the heading in the NIV for uh, Luke chapter 13, repent or perish, sounds harsh, doesn't it? Sounds very harsh. My goodness, we don't wanna hear those kind of words, do we? But is it harsh if we confront somebody we know who is, let's say, smoking and we say to them, if you continue this, it's going to ruin your health? Is that harsh? If we know somebody who is abusing drugs or alcohol, is it harsh for us to, in love and concern, go to them and say, you really need to get help for this because you're going to, you're going to die? Is that harsh? I don't think so. And for God to say this to us, for Jesus to say this to us, repent or perish, it is not harsh for us, speaking the truth in love, to say that to others that we know and love. May we be instruments of the Holy Spirit in reminding people that it's time to repent so that they will not perish. What does it mean to, per repair, to uh, perish? Well, the word that is found here in Luke chapter 13 means to lose something, 
to be destroyed, to be ruined, to die. Jesus doesn't describe exactly what perish means, but we know from other times that he uses the word, he really means to be separated from God. It's not just physical death. It is to, for all of eternity, be separated from God. We need to make sure that we and others will repent so that we are not experiencing that separation. A lot of people are doing like a song I heard back in the 1970s, sitting in the pew, sitting in the pew. Every Sunday morning, you're just sitting in the pew. People think that somehow coming to church is all that they need. But God calls us to repent. And it's my prayer that each and every one of us will do that today, that we will repent and know his forgiveness. The last part of this chapter, verses 6 through 9, not chapter, but this passage, Jesus tells a parable, an illustration of a man who went and for three years he's looked at this fig tree and found that it doesn't bear any fruit and he's disgusted and he tells his gardener, dig that thing up, why waste the soil on it? And the gardener says, no, let me just spend one more year digging around it, fertilizing it, and if after that it doesn't bear fruit, then go ahead, we'll dig it up. What's that all about? I believe what it really is is a statement of God's patience with us. Yes, he demands that we repent, but he is patient waiting for us to finally come to the place where we agree with him and turn our back on sin and not just repent, but stop repeating what we have done over and over and over again. But you know what? God's patience has a limit. It really does. There comes a time when God says, no more, and may God have mercy on us if we ever come to that place where we have said to him, I refuse to repent. What will he say to us? Would you pray with me, please? God, our Heavenly Father, Most of us have heard this all of our life. Sometimes we've seen that big gaudy looking billboard along the highway, repent or go to hell. And we'd like to just dismiss it as radical. But God, here it is in your word. Jesus, your loving savior has told us to repent. Help us to obey. Help us to find the joy of that forgiveness and the power for living a godly life because your spirit comes and lives in us and gives us that ability to be like Jesus. We pray that each one who is hearing this message will most of all hear your voice and respond appropriately. For we pray it in the name of Jesus, our Savior and our Lord. Amen.
Please be dismissed with this blessing. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, that amazing grace, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Go in peace. May God bless you this week.